Welcome back to another episode of the A-Lister Show, where we invite our A-Listers to come talk about what they're up to. We invite movers and shakers to talk about their businesses and things that they're working on. And today I have a special guest. His name is Steve Billman, and he runs a seven-figure Airbnb arbitrage business. So we're excited to learn about that. And uh, he was prior service from the military and kind of worked his way into business. And we're going to hear all about his story. So, um, first of all, I have a fun question to get us kicked off. Yeah. So, when somebody Googles you, they're going to find this picture right here. <laughs> this is you in front of a Lamborghini. Yeah. And the first question I have is, rented or owned? Uh, so, that's actually my friend's Lamborghini. Okay, yeah. nice. <laughs> Neither. <laughs> what model Lamborghini is this? Uh, that's a STO, Huracan. That's sweet. That yeah. thing is sweet. Yeah, so um, tell me about um, what it is you do. What is our Airbnb arbitrage? Yeah, so you'll hear it called a couple different things. You'll hear it called like sublease, rental arbitrage, or Airbnb arbitrage. Uh, all the same thing. Uh, but essentially what it is is renting a property from a landlord, and then with that landlord's permission, of course, um, you take that property, furnish it, get photos taken, and then list it onto platforms like Airbnb, Verbo, Bookings.com. Um, you can even go farther than that and go private to where you have like your own private website or uh, private to where you're listening to like insurance companies, people are traveling for business, um, and even like traveling healthcare, like uh, traveling RNs and stuff like that. Okay. And tell me about the story about how you got into this. Yeah. So when I first got into the Navy, um, this is 2019, um, depending on where you're stationed, but if you get stationed on a ship first, and the ship is in port, of course. Uh, they expect you to live like on the ship, uh, which is a, a big metal box, no phone service. It's really cold. Your bed is uh, not, it's, I think this couch is actually wider <laughs> than the bed. Um, so pretty small and uncomfortable. Um, it stinks. Um, there's nothing nice about it. Um, so what I was doing, I had um, at the time, I think it was a 06 uh, Chevy uh, Silverado. And the back seat was far bigger. And being in San Diego, you know, the weather doesn't get too hot or too cold. So um, I was sleeping in my back seat. Um, I actually have a picture where I have, I don't know if you've seen it, those like inflatable mattresses that fill in like the gap between the yeah. front seat and the back seat. Yeah. So I could have like a close to a full size mattress. Um, and when I was sleeping in the back seat of my truck, I was doing all kinds of things. This is when like uh, crypto was like going crazy on social media. So like everyone and their mom was trying to get into crypto. Um, so I was doing, I was trying to do day trading crypto, uh, but I didn't do too bad. Um, I made a little bit of money from that, but it wasn't like anything predictable as you know. Um, and I didn't have the time to like day trade, uh, because on the ship, usually I was waking up at like five or 6 AM, uh, getting into work and wouldn't get off till like three to 5 PM, somewhere in that range. So didn't have much time to do anything. Um, and then I got into, uh, window tinting like tinting on cars and stuff like that, which is uh, pretty lucrative because being in the military, like you have a pretty, like a um, pretty good network of people and everybody has to drive to work. So made pretty decent money on that. Um, but I knew I had wanted to get into real estate, always had wanted to get in real estate. Um, even before the military, um, I was an entrepreneur. Um, like when fidget spinners first dropped, I sold those in high school. <laughs> fidget spinners? Uh, yeah. Um, I used to buy them wholesale for like, 87 cents a piece and I would sell them for eight dollars a piece. Yeah uh, If any of like my friends from high school see this they're they're gonna know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> like you charged uh, me 10 X. Yeah um, And yeah, and after that um, I did landscaping in high school um, Which was pretty good um, I did tournament fishing growing up. I built fishing rods for people uh, so always like finding new ways like making money um, and, and like I said, I wanted to get in real estate, but I was only 19 at the time. Um, I didn't know anything about credit, anything about what I know now, like seller financing, stuff like this, being able to buy property without the bank, um, as most people are the same way. They don't know that you can leverage things like that without having the bank or loans or even credit. Um, so I was like, well, can't buy anything right now. Um, hadn't been in long enough to utilize VA loan. Um, and so... I ended up going to a bunch of real estate events um, and somewhere along the line, I don't even remember like exactly when, but learning about um, Airbnb arbitrage or rental arbitrage. 
um, and did some research on it, you know, YouTube, Google, Reddit. Um, there wasn't too, too much on it um, at the time. And there was a couple people that were doing it like on social media. And I know now I understand the importance of like having a mentor and stuff like that. Uh, but me, like most people, especially around that age, being hard headed, thinking you can do everything yeah. your own. Um, even in high school, like everybody like doesn't listen to their parents. They think you can do everything on their own. Um, so I thought I had all the knowledge that I needed to get my first arbitrage property. Um, and that's all the knowledge I had was enough to get it. <laughs> um, it was actually in Escondido, which is like, uh, what, 20, 30 minutes from here. So your first, your first deal was in Escondido. Escondido? Yeah. Um, is a three bedroom, two bath with a pool, hot tub, um, ended up getting that property, getting it furnished. Um, luckily I was active duty, so I had Navy fed and Navy fed gives like high limits on credit cards for active duty. Um, I believe it was the Navy fed platinum card. Um, they gave me 35 K on that one at 19, which is, I think is kind of ridiculous, but <laughs> it was cool. Uh, but that's what I used to furnish, uh, the property. Um, I didn't have an LLC or anything like that. I didn't know anything about that. I didn't know anything about business credit. Um, so use my personal credit card to furnish that, uh, which is about, um, that's way overspent than what I would spend now on like a regular property, but I spent about 20 grand, um, like rent, security deposit and furniture included. And, uh, got that property up and going the first month, um, from everything that I knew and just barely scraped by got enough bookings and I was just on Airbnb um, typically like I advise like going on as many platforms as you can but I was just on Airbnb got enough bookings to barely scrape by actually I was still like negative by the end of the month and I was like okay well I can't do this next month because then I won't have a property um, and I did end up getting a mentor um, who taught me uh, not everything that I needed to know but a lot more than I had already known um, I went to a bunch, a bunch of not only real estate, but like business masterminds and stuff like that. Uh, I paid a ton of money for masterminds and mentorships. Um, ended up doing about 10 K the next month on that property. Um, and then averaging about 10 K a month on that property. Um, some months we would do 10 to 13 K, but I say 10 K was about the average, um, with about 50 to 60% profit margin. Um, so we're doing pretty good. And then the landlord on that property, uh, wanted to turn the garage into a fourth bedroom. And he was like, you can stay having guests in it, but we're going to be doing construction on the garage. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that's not going to work. Like, yeah, that's no going to be hard. That's going to get terrible reviews if someone's like, has a jackhammer. Yeah. <laughs> and then somebody's trying to sleep or whatever it may be. Um, so I ended up scrapping that property, taking the furniture um, to a property, my next property that was in Phoenix, uh, which is where my wife's family lives. Um, so I'd done a lot of research on that uh, market and they knew a lot about the market. So um, ended up scaling in that market, uh, got up to six properties in uh, Phoenix. And long story short, um, after being there for a few months, um, I had these contractors, there's a microchip plant being built in Phoenix right now. Um, in fact, they actually extended how long it's supposed to take. Um, but at this time it was, they were projecting a three year um, build time for this whole plant. Um, I had this guy named Eduardo reach out to me um, who is one of the, I don't remember ex his exact position at the microchip plant, but he's one of the workers there. Um, and he had, uh, asked if he could like check out the property and I was like, well, I don't just like let people in and go look at it. So he booked it for a day. Um, they liked the property and then they booked it for a month. Um, and then after that month he was like, Hey, do you do like longer term stays? And like, usually when people say that I expect like one to three months at a time, maybe six. Uh, you'll get the occasional like nine month, uh, which is pretty rare. Uh, but he was like, well, how about like three years? And I was like, I was like, this is arbitrage. So like, I only have the, the lease on this property, depending on the property, it's one to two years, but on that property it was a one year lease. So I was like, um, let me get back to you. <laughs> so I uh, got connected with the landlord. He was cool with it. Just extended my lease another two years. Um, and then while they were staying there, um, he reached back out to me. Um, and asked me if I had more properties. Um, so I ended up filling all the rest of the properties out Wow! Uh, for those contractors to stay there. Um, so yeah. That's great. That so cool. tell me about how you landed your first deal. So your first deal was in Escondido. Mm -hmm. um, you got this idea to where you can rent out an apartment or house and then 
charge someone else more money to, to rent in it and just kind of manage the whole thing. But how did you land that first deal in Escondido? Yeah, so um, typically like how people hear it, they're like, okay, you're renting someone else's house and turn it into Airbnb. They're like, that sounds like a terrible idea. Like who would agree to that? Like who's gonna let you run your business, make two or three times what they're gonna make without you having any liability because it's not your property or anything like that. And Airbnb will cover all the damages. So there's really, as far as it goes for like the host, um, there's like no liability. Um, so how you go about pitching that, um, and this is something that I, I teach as well, um, is you want to pitch it more as like a corporate housing. Um, so essentially what corporate housing is, what I explained before, uh, which is going to be like business professionals, traveling healthcare, um, families that are relocating for insurance, whether it be like fire, flood, whatever it may be that they're relocating for. Um, and I kind of pitch that towards the landlord. Um, and I usually have a list of like things I like to explain to them um, because as like a normal landlord, because if it's on like Zillow or something like that, usually you would just fill out like a Zillow application. Um, and that's like probably 99% of people. So like when you reach out to them, they're probably like really confused or they know exactly what you're talking about. And they're like, no, I'm not letting you turn my house right. into an Airbnb. Um, so, so typically how I go about pitching it is that, go off corporate housing. Um, and then also explain to them that I have a full-time cleaning team. That's me coming through the property anywhere from two to four times a week. Um, so the house is going to be maintained better than any long-term renter could um, because it's getting clean constantly. I mean, I don't know about you, but my house doesn't get a deep clean four times a week. Not quite. Like I, my, I mean, my wife will like vacuum and do the dishes, but it doesn't get like deep clean right. <laughs> like multiple times a week. Um, and the next thing being is that uh, we're having to operate as a business. So if something breaks, um, like a long-term renter, if something breaks, a lot of times they're just like, don't use that thing that breaks, like something like a garbage disposal. Like it'll break and they just don't use it. And so it's broken forever or the landlord has to pay for if, it, if it's broken. Um, with us, if one of our guests breaks something or something breaks, um, if one of our guests break it, of course, we cover it. That's, that's on us. Um, and if it's something that's just like wear and tear, um, we'll pay for it, but it's gonna co we're gonna have it like come out of the the rent itself, or however the landlord wants to work it out. There's a few ways you can do that. Um, and the next thing that I like to pitch them is that we are a business, and if like for some reason, somehow, some way, um, we ran the numbers wrong and it doesn't work out, um, we're not gonna have like a huge like court fight, like dog fight in court where um, they're trying to kick us out and we're not wanting to leave. Like we're a business. If the numbers aren't working, we're gonna take our furniture. We're gonna leave. We're gonna. Only thing that you really get hurt by is the security deposit. Of course, you're not gonna get that back. That's what it's for. Um, but as far as like credit or anything's involved, like it's not gonna hurt you at all. Um, and then the last thing I like to explain to them, especially when it's um, not just like a mom and pop landlord, when it's somebody that's like a real estate investor, um, I like to explain to them that like we are a business, so we're going to be looking to get more properties. So like, as long as this property works out and we do good together, um, we don't want to pick up like your next property, your next property. And that's really the biggest issue that real estate investors have, um, outside of like sourcing and finding the properties, um, is once you have those properties, just keeping them occupied because that's not only is what's going to pay your mortgage, but that's going to hopefully, uh, make you some cash on top. Um, so if I solve that piece of the puzzle for them, they don't have, anything to figure out they just have to get the property and it's they already know it's going to be like i'm already going to fill that spot um then it kind of covers all their bases how did you reach out to this person in the first place so are you just looking on zillow for rentals you get a list of them and just kind of hit the phones is that kind of the strategy yeah so i mean there's a few different ways to do it um of course there's like zillow hot pads redfin all these like platforms you can find rentals on um even like craigslist uh, really good ones actually Facebook marketplace because uh, a lot of those are like listed directly by the owner um, but for the most part I like to s I don't like to use Zillow too much because Zillow is like all, mostly realtors um, every once in a while you, I mean uh, I don't know if I don't remember if you can do it on Zillow but I know hot pads uh, which is a platform that was created by Zillow as well um, you can filter it by seller um, and so it only show sellers actually I think you can do it on Zillow uh, but on hot pads, you can actually filter it by um, corporate lease as well. So it's mm. already people that allow you to mm. essentially take their house and Airbnb it. 
Um, so are you finding people that are looking to rent their properties out or people that are trying to sell their homes? Uh, people that are looking to rent their property out. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how much money can you make off of each property? Yeah. So obviously it's going to range depending on where you're at, but for the most part, I'd say 2x your rent, mm -hmm. meaning if the property is $2,000 a month, um, you can expect to make anywhere from two to $4,000 a month in profit. Um, but if it's like a $2,000 a month property and I can't make $2,000 in profit, like I won't even like touch mm -hmm. it. So, um, but as far as like a little bit of how the numbers go on average, a property gets out like average, like nationwide, uh, gets out, rented out about 70 days or 70%, sorry, um, which is 21 days of the month. Uh, so if you do have a property that's about $2,000 a month, then I would probably rent it out anywhere from two to $300 a day. Um, there's something that I like to like call my, my 10 day rule. Um, so for example, at $2,000 a month property, if I can't make my rent back in less than 10 days, meaning I can't charge more than $200 a day, um, then it's usually a no go mm -hmm. on that property. And what about the incentives to the rent, the, the owner of the property? Are they receiving more rent typically if they sign one of these agreements with you? Uh, so sometimes I'll do like an incentive where um, either I'll pay more per month or I'll pay a higher security deposit. Um, and a lot of times I'll find renters or landlords that are looking for renters that have had their property listed for like months and months at a time. So, you know, they're like they're down that amount of money every month that it's been. Yeah. So you can actually take advantage of that. Um, and a lot of times you can get like free rent, which sounds wild. Um, like if you're not any like if you're not aware of this at all, um, but a lot of times you can take advantage of that and say like, um, not exactly like hey can I get a free month of rent, but um, so what's today January sixteenth? If I'm like hey I want to start my lease uh, February sixteenth, but can I get the keys today so I can make sure everything's good with the house, um, get it all set up and good to go? Because if I start my lease today, um, I still have to get the property set up. Um, whether or not they have like Wi-Fi deadbolts so you can have people come in and out of the house remotely. Um, and then of course, furnishing and decor and then wallpaper, paint, whatever it may be. Um, if you do start the lease today, you're just losing money every single yeah. day that you're doing that. So, um, it's not exactly like, Hey, can I get a month free? But it's, Hey, I'm, can I start the lease on this date and get the keys now so I can get prepared? Um, and it's essentially the same thing as asking for free rent, but the landlords don't see it that yeah. way because... Um, how they'll have it is on the lease. It's going to say lease start date, but yeah. if it says lease start date and then no money <laughs> coming in. Yeah. Well, if the property is vacant and you, um, the, 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 the land, the landlord, they're just happy to lock up a lease, especially if it's been on the market for two, three months, they're having to pay their mortgage, their expenses, but you get to get in and, uh, you know, they lock up that lease and, you know, the apartment's going to be empty anyway, or the house is going to be empty for the next, you know, few weeks anyway. So I could see how that'd be a, a pretty easy thing to negotiate with the people. Because typically, you know, let's say it's today's, today's January 16th, uh, you know, you aren't going to take, you know, you aren't going to move in on the first, I mean, like on, on the next day or two, you're typically going to wait a couple of weeks anyways to move in. So mm -hmm. I can definitely see how that'd be uh, a win-win a for the for the landlord. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Um, so where is your business at today? Uh, so like I said, we sell those properties in Phoenix. Well, I mean, like how big have you been able to scale this? How many properties do you have? Oh, okay. So right now we have 17 properties under management. Uh, and like I talked about, about like uh, corporate leasing, that's like exclusively how I operate now. Um, just because in my opinion, it's better that way. Less day to day, less, just less management overall. Um, the only bad thing about that is that like you can't just have like one or two properties and get like these bigger contracts mm. um, Especially when you're working with like uh, relocation specialists, which usually work with uh, people for Insurance and then like traveling healthcare. care um, They typically want you to have like three four um, a lot of times like five or six properties or up um, to even work with you um, So yeah, right now we're about or not about but we're at 17 properties under management um, it's pretty, uh, passive for the most part because, um, I also teach like how to hire like VAs and stuff, uh, whether it be from like the Philippines and stuff. Cause, uh, the biggest part about this business is not real estate or like rentals. Um, 
it's more of a hospitality business. Yeah. Um, because yeah, real estate's involved, but that is not even like close to the biggest like piece of the puzzle. Um, biggest part is obviously hospitality, like the guests, um, and guests like a uh, communication. And then the next thing is like making a space like a, uh, like kind of how this is like mm-hmm. making a, making a space unique, um, to make people want to stay in it. Um, so yeah. And the Airbnb business and hospitality business in general, like you said, it's not necessarily your typical real estate type of venture, but it's a business, Mm -hmm. right? And it can be like operations heavy where you have to manage the communications with the customer and the communications and and you probably need to have somebody clean the property regularly. You know, you need to have somebody to be able to handle problems on site, Mm -hmm. things like that. Um, do you find that the, that is like the bottleneck, like the operation side of the business or or is is that, is that a thing? And then, you know, if it's not the bottleneck, what is like the bottleneck to growth? Like how can you, what prevents you from continuing to scale? Yeah. So, um, first thing I'm going to say is I'd say what's the backbone of this business? Like, um, is going to be what I like to call my A team, which is going to be like your cleaners, your handymen. Um, whatever extra stuff you might have if you have a pool, pool cleaner, stuff like that. Um, but actually, those are like some of the easiest things to find. Um, they're pretty abundant. Um, there's a few apps, a few websites you can find. Um, there's this one app that I use in particular for cleaners. And typically, the cleaners have somebody that they know as a handyman. I've, for the most part, never really had to go like outsource a handyman myself. Typically, the cleaners um, have somebody that they know. Um, and, uh, the one that I use for cleaners is called Turno now. Um, it was previously known as Turnover b mm. um, So you can obviously see like where the connection is there. Uh, but those are pretty much already vetted cleaners that are already work with Airbnbs. So they're pretty aware because it's a lot different from just cleaning like a single family home versus yeah. like an Airbnb. Because um, some people like to operate to where they have different like bed sheets in every bed which is cool, but it takes a long time to clean the house because you have to wash those and then put them back on the bed. Um, Typically how I like to operate is just all white everything with the duvet and then duvet cover Uh, because duvets, like, you can't wash them constantly. I mean, I don't know if you have a duvet, but, like... There's a pain in the ass to get on and off. Yeah, Yeah. but when you get them, like, it tells you, like, wash once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's how we like to operate. And my cleaners um, come with clean sheets and clean duvet, clean duvet cover. So, like they go in swap everything out you know clean the rest of the house and then they're out there's nothing like they have to wait for the washer and the dryer um like they can clean like no matter the size of the house like two or three hours from top to bottom Mm. okay and um what about you know uh market regulations um one thing that has kind of prevented me from getting into airbnb is you know, understanding and being compliant with the different Airbnb registrations. Mm-hmm. For example, there was a time when I put one of my properties up for Airbnb and I got a letter in the mail from the city and they said, we noticed you might be operating a short-term rental. Uh, you need to have a license in order to do that. You know, you may be responsible for taxes and fines if you don't do that. Mm-hmm. So uh, what is like the, you know, what have you found about the like the registration and like the legal part of you know the city regulations and stuff like that yeah so well first of all were you in san diego no this was northern california in a small town in arcata california i was gonna say san diego has some crazy ones there's like mission beach and stuff like that yeah pretty pretty crazy yeah um but as far as like the rest of the u.s um pretty much how i go about that it's actually pretty simple like before you even think about getting into this um if you find like some cities that you want to get into, first thing I would do um, is go into a website called AirDNA.co, mm. A-I-R-D-N-A.co. Um, and you can like research at either in your area or they also have a list on there that you can pull up that has just like best markets to get into um, like all over the world. Um, next thing I would do is once you find like a few areas that you want to get into, um, I'd recommend like two or three that you think look good. Um, and then just simply Google like STR short-term rental STR regulations and permitting for X city. Um, 
and you should be able to find either the county website or it's going to be like the city website and you'll be able to read up on it and find like what their actual like regulations and permitting are um and for the most part um there's not too many places that don't have like any regulations or permitting at all um but the ones that do they're pretty easy um to get through a lot of them it's either cheap uh, to get the permit or it's free and a lot of times it's just like the address your business um, and then you fill it out and depending on like what city or county you're operating in it's either gonna like pop out like a number and you're gonna put that number at the bottom of your Airbnb description mm -hmm. um, depending on the city some of them give you like the verbiage to say mm -hmm. um, if not just list it in the bottom of your description or they're gonna mail it to you email it to you cities do it different ways um, yeah okay and I'm curious about your mentorship. So that's something I've been really interested in. <laughs> only recently, uh, and only recently because, you know, I'm starting to realize that you can either, you're going to end up paying for your for something, whether it be with your time, time or your or money, money. Yeah. right? And um, as Alex Hormozzi said, when you're trying something new, you're paying down that ignorance debt. Whether you're paying financially, you're paying with your time. And, uh, you know, a, a coach and a mentor can have so many benefits, including, you know, getting to where you want to be faster, um, to avoiding mistakes, and also to help, you know, keep you accountable, um, and just so many other benefits. Um, I'm more curious right now, at, at first, about the mentorship and coaching that you've paid for. Like, have you, like, what kind of money have you spent on mentorship yourself? Like, ever? Like, total? Yeah, I'm kind of curious. Uh... Like, have there been like a really big one where you were like, "Yeah, my most expensive one was a hundred thousand." What? You yeah. spent a hundred thousand dollars on a coaching program? Uh, it's like a, it's more of like a inner circle kind of thing. Okay. Um, it's like a lifetime one that I got into. Um, Whose is that? Can you say? Uh, no, I'm not gonna say it on the podcast. Okay, but, okay. <laughs> uh, but right. it's someone that I work with like pretty often. Um, they're in San Diego too. Um, okay talk, yeah we can definitely talk about that okay um, but i actually like learned a lot from them um joined like their coaching thing and then ended up joining like their inner circle which did is, you pay that hundred thousand cash up front or was it like over a period of time uh so i started with like the 25 uh they had like a 25k one and i joined that one um liked everything um they have like a six month 12 month and then like the lifetime one um so i liked i liked it i liked the people that are hanging out with um and kind of liked having access to like everyone that was in that circle so just paid to like be in that circle how did you make that decision to make such a, a large investment on something that's not even tangible like it's not a, a car it's not a, you could <laughs> buy a car with that amount of money but how did you justify or i mean a lot of people look at that and just be like there's just no way uh, but how yeah. did you justify that how did you what were your thought process on spending such a large amount of money on a coaching program or on on the, on the inner circle mentorship program yeah so how i see it is just proximity um it's kind of hard to be in like a room full of like millionaires and not become one mm -hmm. or at least learn something that's going to get you towards that way uh, it's the same way as like um people buy like supercars or people buy like a Rolex, like, like you don't spend like 15, 20 K on a Rolex, like purely because you think it's cool. Like if there was, if no one else thought they were cool, like you probably wouldn't buy that. Mm. Um, so I guess just access proximity. Interesting. Um, so I, I couldn't help but notice obviously the similarities. Uh, I mean, I'm a big Russell Brunson um, yeah. fan. Me too. Uh, yeah, and just like the execution of your, um, you know, kind of the whole thing looked uh, looked very, very good. You know, you have a lot of social proof. You got a lot of um, t video testimonials, a lot of screenshots. Um, you know, your the, the content quality you're producing is very high. Um, you know, you you got the click funnels going. Um, so, are you uh, are you a student of Russell Brunson, and um, have you learned a lot about uh, marketing and, and business from him? Yeah, Russell Brunson, Alex Ramosi, uh Yeah, that's like I, I learned a lot from them. Um, even like not their stuff that's like in their paid stuff. Um, I mean, I've read like all their books. Um, even like when I'm in the shower, like after the gym or something, like um, I'll listen to like their stuff while I'm in the shower. Uh, I even like re-listen, especially to a lot of Alex Hermosi stuff. Um, and something 
really big like being in the military you'll stand watch a lot Mm -hmm. um which is like sounds boring yeah four or five hours you just pretty much sit there with like a a vest and a pistol and a m4 um but like i'd pop it uh, airpod in and listen to alex ramosi's podcast and his youtube videos um that's honestly like a lot of times like what kept me going and what motivated me um i don't know what it is but he like thinks a lot of how i think because um if you talk to my wife, she'll like she'll tell you like she's gotten like a lot better with it now. But when we first got together, she's like a super um, like empathetic and like caring person. Whereas I'm like um, just like a get it done person. Like I don't care like how I feel. I'm gonna go to the gym. Like I don't care how tired I am or how I feel. Like I'm gonna do it because mm-hmm. it needs to get done. Like somebody needs to do it. So um, yeah. That's what I, so I Alex Ramuzzi and Russell Brunson, um, are there any other mentors or podcasts or YouTube that you're like constantly learning from and studying? Um, I forgot his name. Um, he's somewhat of a newer guy. I think his name is, I think it's Dan something. Hmm. He does a lot of like mindset and like motivational stuff on YouTube. Okay, cool. Um, what about uh, so one thing you mentioned too? Just kind of you just kind of briefly mentioned it, but you said that you re-listen to stuff. I think that's such a big, um, a really big indicator even of success and successful people is they don't just listen to something or take something in one time and then just discard it. They kind of go back and they, they reread it. Is that something you do also? Yeah. So um, actually, I re-listen to stuff a lot, like a lot. Um, I really have found that like almost I'd say like nine out of ten times do I read something or I listen to like a video um I'm just listening to it or just reading it I'm not like taking it in um and not only until like the second or third time does it like I'm like oh oh mm-hmm. um and then I connect it to things like that are actually happening like in my situation and like um yeah I would say because uh, I know something that a lot of people do is they'll watch a video and a lot of times when you're listening to someone, they're like way farther ahead than you are. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, it means something, mm-hmm. you know, it's supposed to like do something, but you're like, doesn't make any sense to you. Um, it's like if Albert Einstein was trying to teach you math, you'd be like, I know this is important. I know it's like good, <laughs> but I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people do that and they get analysis paralysis because they have like all this stuff and they're like, they know it's good information, but they don't know what to do with any of it. Um, so I would either say there's two different kinds of people. There's people that like will listen to things like over and over and it finally connect um, and click with them, which is me. Or there's those people that like listen to them and it makes sense the first time, um, but they don't do anything with it. So then it's just, you it's like just wasted time. You essentially did nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say uh, whether, whatever person you are, um, listen to that thing and actually like take action on it. Yeah. Tell me about your your business, your program that you have to help other people get involved? Yeah, so actually how I started that um, was while I was still active duty, um, people would see like the things I would do like on my story or they'd see like the people I'd be hanging out with or they'd see the cars I'd be driving, uh, whether it be mine or like my friends, whatever it may be. Um, and obviously, I mean, humans being humans, they're curious. They're like, what are you doing? Tell me your secrets, stuff like that. Uh, so I started actually teaching a few people like, like for free um just spend a lot of my time teaching people um and people actually started getting out of the military like doing this full time um and people like actually making a lot of money from it um because uh i'm only e5 um right even right now i'm e5 um but at the time i started i was e3 um, and all the people i hung out with were about the same rank um, which you don't make very much, depending on if you're married or not, anywhere from two to five thousand dollars a month, which no matter where you live, especially in San Diego, is not it's a tough, lot of yeah. not a lot of money at all. Um, and a lot of them, um, just starting out, would make um, anywhere from like eight to ten thousand dollars a month within like their first few months, which is for a lot of them doubling, even tripling, what they were making a month. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, pretty good at teaching these people. Um, but the only like issue was that it was costing like all my time Mm -hmm. and I wasn't making anything like from teaching these people. Um, and another thing is that like, it was all just like word of mouth. If I was teaching them how to do something, it was just like, Hey, do this. And then tell the next person like, Hey, do this. So it's kind of like repetitive. Um, so 
I was like, okay, well, I'm good at this. People like doing it. It helps people make a lot of money. So what I'm going to do is make a program that actually works because I've bought everyone's program like in this space, Airbnb arbitrage, rental arbitrage. Um, I've seen everyone's course. Um, yeah, I've bought everybody's course. I know what's out there. I know what's good. I know what's not. Um, so what I did was took all of that knowledge, what I already knew, um, and then pretty much filled in the gaps what people were missing. Um, so I created like a perfect like A to Z program that would get somebody there. Um, and not only that, like, cause I don't, um, believe like a course is like that great. It'd be like going to college and your teacher handing you the book and then walking out. Mm -hmm. Um, people need like human engagement, human involvement. Um, whether it be for like reassurance, if they do know the answer, um, see people, a lot of times people are not very confident in themselves. Um, even if it's just that. Or some pe sometimes people really don't get it. They don't grasp it. So they need somebody there to explain it differently than how it was in the video. Um, so yeah, um, I have the course um, that I like people to go through. Um, and then it gives them all of my PDFs, um, all my documents, my scripts, uh, my legal documents, anything that you could need um, to do this business. And then I usually do a couple of Zoom calls a week with my students as well. Um, and then outside of that, I have like my own inner circle, um, which is for people that are not just trying to do like ten, twenty thousand dollars a month, but people that are trying to like really scale and get to seven figures through this business. Um, and that's like my inner circle is more exclusive. Like I don't just let anyone in there if they have the money to get into it, and I don't want to work with them. I'm not going to let them get in there because it's my inner circle. It's not just like hopping on group Zoom calls. It's me doing zoom calls with you one-on-one -on -one, and then me actually like working in your business setting up like your airbnb listings your automations uh, for messaging automations for cleaners handymen and then uh, one of the biggest one your automations for check-in and check-out as well as your automated pricing um, so really actual like true working with you one-on-one -on -one. Um, so yeah that's a little bit about the basics of it okay and uh, are you are you kind of doing the education part more full time now? I mean, is that kind of taking up more and more of your time as you're growing that side of the business? Yeah. So with rental arbitrage, I got to a point. Um, right now, I'd say we do between eighty to a hundred k a month. Uh, but right around like the twenty to thirty k a month is when like I was like, uh, I mean, I'm only twenty three now. Um, but at the time I had just turned 22 and I was like being that young, like making that much money. I was like, okay, like I don't want to keep doing this forever. Like, um, and like I said, I got it to where it was like, I'd say like 95% passive where there's almost nothing I had to do, uh, except for like put out fires like here and there. Uh, but it was not really any day to day, uh, maybe like a couple hours a week that I had to like take care of things. Um, so I was like, yeah, it was cash flow. Um, having was having like the money problem, I was having to like buy stuff just to like cover for taxes. Um, but I was also having like a fulfillment problem, like personal fulfillment. Mm. Um, to where yeah, I was making a lot of money, but like now what? Like, like yeah, I hang out with my wife and stuff, but I still have like the drive to like be successful, and like I want to do like tons of things. So I was like, okay, um, I created the course, created the program. Um, and I found that that's like what I like really do enjoy um, helping people that are around my age, even younger, uh, sometimes older, uh, but like create financial freedom, um, even within a couple months. Um, and a lot of times, or I'd say I'm almost every single time I teach them how to do it, like with business credit. Um, so with business credit cards, uh, they're typically depending on like the bank that you're with, but they're anywhere from like 12 to 18 months of like 0% interest business credit cards. Um, so essentially I can show them how to build a business. Um, say they spend 15 K 10 K on a credit card and that credit card's costing them say it's a thousand dollars a month. It wouldn't be that much, but just for math's sake, uh, say it's costing them a thousand dollars a month and a property is profiting them $3,000 a month. Now they're effectively putting $2,000 a month in their pocket or they're rolling it over into the next property. But they're, pro they're profiting $2,000 a month and that credit card is costing them $1,000 a month. Now they've effectively created a profitable business, extremely profitable business, um, without having to spend a single dollar mm -hmm. uh, because they're leveraging business credit. So that property is going to pay off that credit card 
um, it's going to profit. And you can either use the credit combined with the profits and like roll over properties extremely fast, or you can just strictly use the profits and you can pick up a new property every few months. Yeah. Um, so what's next for you? You've kind of built out about 17 properties and now you're helping other people do something similar. Um, do you have another business plan? Or are you going to continue to kind of grow these ones? Or what's like, uh, do you have a, like a five year vision of where you see this going? Yeah, so when I had first, like I said in the beginning, like getting into real estate, um, I didn't think I had anything that it took to buy real estate. Because uh, traditionally I wanted to get, or originally I wanted to get into like multifamily. Um, and so. I've already like bought mentorships. I've already started pursuing that uh, multifamily, and I want to get into Section Eight as well. Um, and start building out those portfolios as well as at the same time, uh, while I'm learning those things and building those things, and getting good at those things, I expand uh, my mentorship as well. Um, so I'm not just teaching Airbnb, but I can also teach um, like wholesaling, uh, multifamily, uh, Section Eight. I've actually done wholesaling. I did that. I didn't talk about it, but I did it like right before I did. Mm -hmm. Rental arbitrage, I did a, a few properties. Um, but yeah, I just ultimately want to just keep rolling into real estate, bigger and bigger real estate, um, and then also teach people how to do the same. Yeah, great. Um, can we touch on your wholesaling uh, yeah, experience? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's something I'm interested. I'm getting I'm getting into it. Um, I did my first real estate flip last year, and I made $100,000 on my first flip, and that kind of that's got good. me. Yeah, you know. <laughs> really good. I, I didn't even realize it was that good until I went to the real estate conference and people were talking about, yeah, I made $25,000 on this flip, I made $30,000 flip. And I was like, how much? I made a hundred grand on my first flip. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, hundred grand's like a unicorn. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and so uh, one problem with flipping is that it takes a long time. It takes a long time to get in and out. Uh, it takes a long time to get funded. It takes a long time. If you're using your own money, then you can only cycle like one or two properties a year. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's hard to scale. Uh, and that's why I kind of got interested in wholesaling because wholesaling, you know. It's more predictable. It, it can be if you know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, but also it seems a little more scalable to where you're doing marketing, you're doing sales, you're doing disposition, and then you can kind of build up the operation. So I'm really attracted to wholesaling. That's kind of what I'm focusing on now. Can you tell me about any of the properties that you were able to wholesale in the beginning? Yeah, so what I went after uh, was like lower income states. Um, actually, I don't think I ever went outside of like Ohio. That's where I got my uh, first slip. Yeah, so it, it's a pretty good place to do it, uh, whether it's like wholesaling or Section 8. It's really good to get into real estate because it's low barrier of entry. Um, even you can buy a property for like 50, 60K there. Yeah. Um, put like 5K down depending on who you're working with. Um, but as far as wholesaling goes, um, I've only done three uh, to date. Um, it is a lot of work. Um, and it's not so, it's a lot, it's really hands-on. Um, How did you get your first property? Uh, so actually, I listened to a lot, of, you know, Pace Morby? Yeah. So I listened to a lot of Pace Morby. I never joined his mentorship. I almost did. Um, I listened to a lot of Pace Morby, and I listened to a lot of um, Bigger Pockets. Um, and then there was this one podcast with Pace Morby uh, where he was talking about, have you heard of Privy? Privy, Privy, no. Oh, it's a platform that will, it shows everything, um, whether it's like foreclosure, taxes, whatever it may be on the property. But uh, Privy is a good, really good, really, really good platform for wholesaling. Um, and that's how I picked up all those properties. Um, Cold calling? Yeah. Just Which cold list calling. were you cold calling? Um, tax liens, um, and then one was a uh, foreclosure, um, and then just skip tracing. Okay, so you get a list of properties from Privy, tax liens or foreclosures, and then you're just kind of dialing for dollars, off making offers. How many offers do you think you submitted before you closed your first deal? Um, so actually, um, I kind of functioned in the same way that like I guess it just kind of makes sense to me in my brain. Um, is like how I find rental arbitrage properties, it's people that like have had a property on the market for a minute. Um, so the first thing I did was set it for 90 plus days. Um, and I found this lady, uh, that was 90 plus in, days, sorry, uh, 90 plus days like uh, on the market. Okay. So you're going after properties that were on the market. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, and then 
had found out she had also had a tax lien on it. Um, this was in Akron. Um, she sent me property uh, pictures of property. Um, I, this property was like te- I still have pictures on my phone too. Uh, it was terrible, terrible. But I was like, whatever. I was like, everybody's talking about wholesaling. It's just find find mm-hmm. really ugly properties. Uh, so I was like, okay. Um, and then, do you know um, what are their names? The dad and the son that do wholesaling. Um, Flip with Rick. Yeah, Flip with Rick. Um, so I went on one of his live streams, um, and then he was going over, like, how he built, like, his seller's list and stuff like that. Um, so I pretty much pursued that, which just is a lot of, like, Facebook groups and then finding sellers and stuff like that. Um, and I connected with her, um, got the, um, like, the agreement that Flip with Rick uses, and uh, sent that over to her, got it signed, and then they used the... Um, What's it called? What it's called? Where well, they hold the title? Escrow. Or yeah, yeah, title. Oh, yeah. We use her escrow company that she was using, uh, which, which I found out was wrong. Like usually, you want to use yours. Mm. Um, we used hers um, and closed on that property. Um, I think she was selling it for thirty something, uh, and all the buyers were like, "No, no, that's like terrible, terrible." <laughs> um, I think the highest I got offered was like twenty two. Um, so I offered her 15, um, she denied it for like the longest and then it was blowing up like crazy. People were all over that, that property. Uh, but no one was, no one was taking it. And then eventually after a few weeks, she came back to me. Um, actually she signed the contract. I saw that my DocuSign, like you, if someone views the contract says so-and-so yeah. like viewed it. Um, so it said viewed and I was like, Oh, okay. She's interested. Uh, and she signed it and I called her right away. She's like, yeah, I guess I'll do it. I reached back out to the buyer. Um, he was like, yeah. I'll still do it. Um, Close that one. And actually the buyer, um, he's not like on social media or anything, but he's a, um, his name is Gary. He's an older, really old guy um, in his 60s. (laughs) A really Um, old guy in his 60s. Compared to me. Compared (laughs) to me, pretty old. Um, But he was like, told me like all the ins and outs, what to watch out for, like what to do. Um, Not even like a mentor or anything, just uh, connected with me on Facebook Messenger. And then uh, for like three days in a row, we talked on the phone for like, two hours wow. like a day um how did you find this guy uh, he was the buyer uh, oh he was the buyer yeah from a facebook group i posted it in the facebook group and then you know how everybody would just like comment yeah. their their email and i yeah. sent him up details um and then he ended up buying it and then he's telling me like what i did wrong what i did right what i should do next time all this stuff um i haven't talked to him since after mm-hmm. those like three days we just talked on the phone and he like i just took notes for days um so yeah. you submitted the offer for 15000 but uh, you found a buyer before she signed the contract, or did she end up signing the contract before you found the buyer? No, so I found the buyer first. Um, so I just posted the property like uh, on a few or a lot of wholesaling pla- uh, Facebook groups, um, and he or I had a bunch of buyers message, and I sent it all out. I sent the email out to all of them, all the details on Before it. Before you had it under contract, you're sending it out to buyers. Yeah, so um, the way I did it, because it's kind of like frowned upon if you post like all the details in yeah. the Facebook group. So I just didn't post any pictures of it. I was like, uh, I have a potential property under contract. Um, this is where it's at. This is what the numbers are like. Um, and to kind of keep it like hush hush. So it's like didn't get in trouble for like listing a property that I didn't have under contract. Yeah. Um, I was sending it through email. Uh, so mm-hmm. people could see, like, the actual buyers could see it, but it wasn't on, like, Facebook. Uh, and then once I had somebody that was interested then, um, I reached back out to her and, like, told her, let's go. Um, and then... How much did you make on that one? Uh, that one I made seven grand. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Seven grand. Um, but at the time, like, this was when, like... What year uh, was this? I think this was... 2021. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I heard that was a hot year for yeah. Uh, this is the so I was like, damn, that's terrible. Because <laughs> uh, 2021, like everybody, that's when people were getting like 30, 40k, even sometimes like a 50k wholesale contract, and I'm like, that's insane. So that's what I was shooting for. Um, but obviously, in like a place uh, like Ohio, there's not yeah very expensive property, so it's kind of fu- hard to find that gap. Um, but I was just like, um, I didn't know know the market, but I understood it. Um, and the properties were pretty cheap. So I was like, okay, well, if like, if I do something wrong and I lose here, like it won't be like an insane amount. 
Um, and that's that's the one thing I did like about uh, wholesaling was that like you're just getting a property under contract. So like yeah, if you no can't money. find if you can't find buyers, like you just back out. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you lose like your your earnest money. But mm-hmm. I think I only put uh, like 150 bucks down for my earnest okay. deposit on nice. the property. So. Cool. We've got a few more minutes here. Um, I just wanted to compliment you. I think it's awesome that, uh, you know, you are just, you seem like a, one of those hustle and grind type guys, um, you know, and to do the kind of businesses that you have gotten into, they're the kinds of things that a lot of people will try for a couple of weeks and then just kind of give up. And it seems like the ones that make it are the ones that are willing to just grind through the nose willing to uh, educate themselves and, uh, you know, find the people that can help them through it. So I think that's really awesome. Um, and I'm still like shocked about the hundred thousand uh, dollar inner circle thing you did. <laughs> and I'm like fascinated by this because I'm seeing more and more of these offers that are like really, really high ticket. Mm-hmm. And it's just incredible that, um, and you know, I, I, while I see the value, I couldn't, ever pull a trigger on like a $30,000 coaching program personally, because I still have a lot of that, like, you know, hard headedness that, um, you know, I'm, 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 I feel like I'm like 70% there in a lot of stuff. So, mm-hmm. um, am I, I'm paying like a large amount of money for like that little missing pieces. Yeah. But, um, you know, they can be so valuable if you can take a shortcut in some ways. And that's really what you're doing is, you know, uh, we only have a short amount of time on this earth. And so if you can get a shortcut that's going to take you down, that's going to save you two or three years on your journey, you know, how much is two or three wor- years worth of fast tracking yeah. your goals in life? And so that's, that's quite incredible. Did your wife, uh, was you, were you married at the time that you, yeah. Did you, did you talk to this, this deal, this kind of, this, this prospect with there? like, Hey, there's this coaching program. I'm thinking about spending this money. No. So with my wife, um, she's not like most people's wife. So I would say a lot of people like their wife, like keeps guys from like buying things that they want or cool stuff like that. She's like, she trusts me like a hundred percent. If I say I'm going to do something, she's like, like, she'll tell me what she thinks, but she's like, I'm not gonna stop you. I'm not going to any of this she's like if you if you think it's a good idea then do it yeah like, that's it's, that's as far as it goes really there you go um i think it's really key um as as far as like a marriage while being an entrepreneur because being an entrepreneur is not like having a nine to five job like you know you're gonna work this many hours a week you're gonna make this much money uh, entrepreneur there's gonna be really really low lows and there's gonna be really high highs so you need to have someone that's gonna be that understands that because um and i'm not trying to be like make this sound like weird or anything like that but a lot of like women when men like are in a really low spot um they'll just see it as that um they're like okay like he sucks <laughs> uh, but she's seen like both sides she's seen when i've been really low she's seen when i've been really high she she can see like what i'm capable of um so she, she trusts me 100 percent. yeah um and then as far as that mentor thing as far as something that uh, helped me get rid of that block um Something that I didn't believe in for a really, really long time um, is money treats you how you treat it. Mm. Um, so look at money as just a tool. And purely is that. Um, if you're greedy with money, it's going to be greedy on how it gets to you. Uh, if you're letting money flow out, um, it sounds dumb, but it, like it'll always flow back to you. Um, obviously, like if you buy a hundred thousand dollar mentorship and then. Um, you go freaking eat Doritos and sit on your couch. Obviously, it's not going to flow back to you, but like, um, treat money how you want it to treat you. Um, and the next thing I look at, I like how, like I, like, I guess make it okay to spend like large amounts of money like that. Um, is, I don't know if you've ever heard of it before, but like, sometimes people see more value in things purely because it's more expensive. Yeah. Like you can see this table for twenty dollars, and then drive to LA and see the exact same table for two hundred dollars. Um, like the perceived value of it is gonna be higher. Um, and even in knowing that, um, I have noticed that like teaching people, um, and then paying for mentorships and seeing other people paying for mentorships, uh, the people work harder. Um, like when they spend more. Um, I've seen mentorships that are a thousand dollars be better be way better than a $10,000 mentorship 
but the ten thousand dollar mentorship works way better because people spent ten thousand yeah, dollars on it. They're committed. So they're out ten thousand dollars versus out a thousand dollars. I mean, like, mm-hmm. it sucks, but like, thousand dollars ain't gonna kill you. Yeah. And depending on who you are, ten thousand dollars might. Yeah. One of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite um, stories is Alex Ramosi talked about a wine test, and he said, um, you know, he put out these different wines and told them the values of them all. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this wine is a two dollar bottle of wine. This bottle of wine is twenty dollar. This bottle of wine is a, is a three thousand dollar bottle of wine. And they ran taste tests and they asked people to choose their favorite bottle of wine. And the numbers were very clear that people perceive the value of the three thousand dollar wine to be the best tasting and have the highest quality, even though they were all happened to be the exact same bottle of wine. So. Um, and he talked about how you need you have a responsibility to charge more because if you charge more for your price for your products and services, then your students are going to take it more seriously and the results are going to be higher. Mm-hmm. And so, not only should you charge more, but you have a responsibility to do so because you are responsible for the outcomes of your of your clients. And so, uh, that that perceived value is a big part of. I don't know, the benefit that they get from any particular yeah. purchase that they make. Yeah, I noticed when I first like launched my like program mentorship, um, I had it for like I think I started at like two thousand um, dollars. It was cool, but people would like buy it and then wouldn't even like watch the first video, or they'd watch the intro video and like wouldn't make it through anything, and they wouldn't even set up their LLC. Um, and then now I have like my inner circle, which is like um, pretty expensive. It's my most expensive product. And those are my most successful like yeah, students. I bet. Um, even if the ones that are like had 15k in their bank account and like that's what they spent to get in my inner circle, um, like those have been the best people to work with. They're the easiest to work with. Anytime I tell them to do something, they do it right then. Um, the course um, sometimes it takes people like months to get through. Those people get through it in a day. Um, they're just better. It's better for both sides. Um, yeah. I get. More, it's more worth my time to work with them. I can pour into them more um, because not only did I get paid more, which is cool, but I know they're going to take it more seriously. So I know like what's coming out of my mouth is actually going to hit yeah. and it's going to work. Um, and on the opposite side, um, they know they paid that much. Um, they realize that I'm pouring into them um, and it's just, it's just mutual and it works really well. Yeah, absolutely. Military to millionaire. This is Stephen. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Uh, You can check him out on all the socials. Uh, We'll put his link in the description. Uh, Thank you very much for checking out this episode of The A-Lister. There's got a lot more content coming. We're going to be interviewing movers and shakers, people doing interesting stuff. So subscribe and follow along with our journey. Thank you very much and see you next time.